We have an exciting panel ahead of us where we will be talking about uh, how to challenge um, the skills divide and in inequality. And for that, you will have here a moderator, Professor Jark Arvikso, who is currently the rector of Tallinn University of Technology, having previously served as a rector for Tartu University and has served as the Minister of Education and Research, Minister of Defence, and he is a member of the Estonian Academy of Science and has worked in many foreign institutes as a guest professor, uh, among them the Max Planck Institute for Solid State Research in Stutt Stuttgart, Germany, the Osaka University in Japan and the Paris Diderot University. Haravikso, please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of work. I think we've heard several good news during this conference, one of them being that the work will stay with us forever. <laughs> it's not going to disappear. So all those of you who were afraid that something bad will happen with work may be disappointed, but the ones who love to work, be it then from 5 to 9 or 9 to 5, they have a bright future ahead. We are coming to a close. In less than an hour, we'll convene this meeting with, I hope, enthusiastic news about the future of work. But before doing that, I think we try to summarize a little bit what we've discussed so far. And I'm most happy to invite to join me on the stage for prominent uh, panelists first, I'd like to invite the colleague, Maltese Minister for Education and Entrepreneurship, Mr. Evarist Bartolo. Please join us. Oh. Linguist by training, having a background in journalism, politics, this is as is true with all the panelists, I hope, including myself, a lifelong learning exercise. Trying to face new challenges, adapting ourselves to changing environments, and doing so successfully. Let's move to our next panelist. Let me invite here Mike Freerich, CEO of Allison. Please, Mike. Welcome. Thanks, we just heard a presentation of what Alison is doing. Millions and millions of young and not so young and elderly people joining the platform to increase, enhance and develop the skill levels. Challenges ahead. Wonderful experience and a good example to draw conclusions and take it as a lesson for all of us. Thank you for joining us. May I next invite Dr. David Porter, who comes from Canada, Ontario, eCampus Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and last but not least, Dr. Jacques Bugin. Please join us. Thank you. Welcome. I haven't been able to join all the, all the presentations, but what I heard today is truly encouraging. The overall atmosphere being enthusiastic and problem-solving. As said before, we know, some of us for quite some time, that there is good future for work, provided we are ready for the new challenges. Since quite some time, we've seen a shift from knowledge-centered education to more skills, from knowing to doing, from 
talking about things happening to making things happen. That's what's expected from all of us. We've also heard the challenges that our educational institutions face. And I was thinking about my present institution, Taltech, the Technical University of Technology. What's going to be its future in 10 to 15 or 20 years' time? Luckily enough, all these enthusiastic presenters today, they challenge the classical institutions despite the fact that they are all graduates of some most prominent universities <laughs> in the world. I'm sure your institutions, your alma maters, are able to learn, able to face the challenges, change them, hopefully fast enough and deep enough and cheaply enough, if I remember one of the, challenge, <laughs> one of the presenters today <laughs> challenging our educational institutions. I also thought about a song that some of you might know. Schools out for summer, <laughs> schools out for ever. Alice Cooper, <laughs> 70s, 40 years ago. <laughs> the schools are still there, and the schools will be there together with the work. So it's not about schools out, it's not about dramatically changing the paradigm of education, but rather adapting to the environments. And I hope we are ready. And this small meeting here in north of Europe with bad skiing weather all the year round tries to contribute to this challenge in its own, own way. May I now present a question to the panel concerning Governments, people, enterprises. We know that our governments spend 5 to 6 percent of GDP on education. 5 to 6 percent. It's a very big number. We also know that they spend this money mainly to institutions, not to education, even in the classical sense of it. But what we need is not the institution, it's not the ultimate goal. What we need is educated people, skills that match the demand. So my question goes, provided, uh, provided we understand where we are heading, provided we, we know the all new platforms, what's your advice for politicians and policymakers? What might be the change in the role of the governments, including allocating funding to this enterprise of future education and needs of the labor market? Who's willing to start? I think equity is the, the critical piece. I think that governments need to see that an investment in an education infrastructure is what will pave the road to the future. And I think that in the past they built highways and they built railways and they built hospitals and schools. And now that information highway is the internet. And unless we level the playing field and give everybody equitable baseline access, uh, we are not going to achieve our goals for the future. Um, it's important that governments play a proactive role here and create some kind of access policy that states a minimum standard of access for every citizen and that every citizen has access to the internet either in their home, at their library, or in their school. We have to make sure that the baseline coverage exists. After hearing uh, the, your presentations, this morning, I felt like I had to apologize for existing, <laughs> because I, I'm more a part of the problem than of, of, of the solution. Uh, but I, I'd like to see myself, perhaps I'm a bit schizophrenic, as being also a disruptor of education. So there's still a bit hope for me in this. Well, I think one of the first things that we need to do is actually not have ministries of education anymore, but ministries of lifelong learning. Yeah. 
not just a change of name, but change of mission, change of vision, change of budget, and the change of structure. Because I think for the time being, most ministries of education cater for institutions and also on the compulsory age segment, and then it's as if it's not our responsibility anymore. So I would, I would say that that is the way to go. Number two, talking about the potential of education, let's also talk about the limits of education. Education on its own cannot do all these things. And I think we need to think of, you know, the, the fact that there need to be socio and economic policies to support and reinforce what happens in education. There are people, and we spoke about them in this excellent conference, that first we need to put them in a situation where they can benefit from education. If you are excluded from society, if you are excluded from employment, if you are below the poverty line, you're not going to be in a position to benefit. So when we talk about skills poverty, because we're talking about inequality, it's about skills poverty, that is the same kind of poverty that is tied to other, to other uh, kinds of poverty. Then I think, and I agree totally with you, David, that governments and even the EU should start considering investing in skills as a strategic investment, not just in the hardware, but also in actual. And even now we find that difficult, even in the Juncker plan and even in the FC. And it's still, it's still, we are still competing with the hardware. We're still competing with the old infrastructure for investment. If we really believe that skills is the way forward, we need to make it easy for people to have the financial resources and for governments to have financial resources in the same way that it is making it possible to invest in railways and bridges and things like that. So I really believe that that is, that is the way to go. Uh, there's a beautiful Indian proverb which says that it takes a village to raise a child and to educate a child. Now to educate someone lifelong, we need the whole country you know, involving everyone and also beyond. And I think that is the way to go. The future depends on, on how much we manage to develop the skills and talents of our people. But we need to do it in a tangible way. Jacques. Yeah, I, I obviously tend to agree. But, uh, let's put a few facts on the table. Uh, first, education as it is today is not a bad investment. So let's not throw the water and the baby together. Uh, the, uh, you know, our investment is always between the 10 to 20 percent. Not bad especially if it's public money, you know, there's not a lot you know, of project where you can get this kind of return, but that return would change, and we all know it's going to go down. The second observation is that if you look at education, uh, but you look within enterprises, if you look at the ROI of investing in these technologies, you come to an interesting surprise. The technology itself has no return. It's the complementary assets to that technology, and mostly your job, the way you interact with the technology that create the ROI, and in most of the case, when you look at the literature, the ROI of that investment within firms is not 12%, it's 40, 50%. So first observation, uh, yes, it's a good investment, but the best investment is coming when people are obviously in the flow of employability and in complementarity with capital. There's no opposition between capital and labor. It's complementary. And first observation, if you are on the public side, I think it's important not to fragment. It's important to say to firms, today, look at the video we got. This lady is saying, I was bored of my job nine to five. When you do the same research, 60% of people are saying, I'm bored of the work I'm doing. And I don't know what I have to do, I didn't exploit my skills. So first of all, we have to remember, we need more skills, but skills are not yet exploited correctly. That's point number one. Point number two, yes, we will have a problem of transition, but the problem of transition on the skill side, uh, we can think all your ideas, I just like them. But I think it's still very fragmented because at the end of the day, the fundamental issue is that it's not about public versus private. It's about structure and leadership. This is a system where you're going to need to move uh, uh, from a system to another system. And whatever you look at, there will be roadblock. And you know, even when you change jobs from one industry to the other one, it does not take two years, it takes five, six years, much longer than the life of a politician. 
So that means you need leadership. <laughs> Whatever it takes, it takes leadership. So I will say, I don't care who you are, but are you a leader? And it's nothing to do with your politician and the like. And by the way, I will tell you, I prefer to pay that politician very much so because of your leadership than not paying it well. That's what Singapore and all these countries do. And I think it's very important to have that. And from the paradox as well is that if we believe the system change, let's change the system. So education today is a kind of an ice and cost that we pour to us. We go to school at seven years old. We go for a great curriculum. And then we say, please give me a job. <laughs> now, that's a very high sunk cost strategy. This is the slow age of industrial education. This is the way we have done in industry, too. We got machine, we put them, we put love capital, and let's work. But education has to be viabilized. And, and the point is that we have tons of orthodoxies that we don't challenge. And I think the government, as well as behind the politicians, need that leadership and that way of thinking with an intellectual like you to make sure that they change the orthodoxies of, uh, because we, we not necessarily look back at the assumptions we're making. And the assumptions are likely to be so effective because that's the old system and it worked that we never go back to them. So my point, summary one, great ROI, let's not kill it. Two, let's cooperate. Firms have a lot of interest to do it. And three, it's a challenge. I don't think I will be having the kind of leadership potential to do it. So you need great politician, well paid, and people thinking with this politician to change the orthodoxy of the system. Thank you. Mike. Yeah, I guess a, a few observations. I, I get, the one great opportunity that we have globally is that uh, sometimes you look at education systems and you wonder why they haven't been more innovative over the years. And the truth is that uh, education is very political. In times past, it was important what people learned. So you, you had education systems very, very tight to pol politics and to government. But technology changes that because it doesn't recognize borders in any way, and particularly people just learning through English in particular around the world. So you see government backing away, but properly so. Um, there's a challenge for, for government looking around to ask for advice as to who to, who to follow in terms of being the innovator. Uh, some, some colleges um, price their, what they offer very incorrectly, and uh, asking them to change is like asking turkeys to vote for Christmas. And uh, so you need to be careful who you're asking advice from. So I think the first thing is governments, you know, the first thing that the government minister does when he's challenged on education not being innovative enough is to call in the presidents of the local universities. And it's just like, that's absolutely not the place to start. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but although the, you have to bring that person along. Uh, so the innovators, you have to look for the innovators. The innovators are probably pe the people that are not belonging to the status quo. And uh, so you have to be brave enough and bold enough to think of saying, who's actually really adding value here? And just to go back to the point that you, 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 you said in your preamble there, uh, universities are not going anywhere. Our colleges are not going anywhere. Certainly the worst of them are, uh, may be suffering demise, but the best of them will be there and be strong for, for as long as I can see. Really what universities need to do is to, to focus on what, are they, what, what is the unique value add that they bring. And uh, economics is a big issue of it because a lot of the pricing is not for, for instance, if you do a chemi chemical degree, a lot of the value that you give to the students is the time that they spend in the very expensive laboratory. But the eight weeks <laughs> that they spend learning could actually be done online. So repricing of university needs to, uh, of what they offer has to happen. And, um, and then, then the things, other things that are unique, obviously the facilities, the peer-to-peer -peer learning, it's very hard to replace the intense stuff at a higher level of learning. So I don't see them going. And I guess the real challenge for teachers, um, a, a lot of the stuff is becoming, all the fact-based learning is becoming more and more profoundly uh, transferable online. So the challenge for teachers is, is to almost get away from the teaching because that is being done by uh, a yeah. more automated one. The challenge is for teachers to become mentors because that's, they're, they're being asked to step up uh, to a high, it's not just getting facts and figures into a kid's, but can you make that young kid a civic leader? Can you make them responsible? Can you teach them all of the higher levels of values that we get excited about? That's their challenge. They need to step up. Can, can, I, can I just make a point on, 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 on Mike's? Because I, I, some people say, well, it's a, it's a provocative debate between the incumbent and the, and the digital. Uh, we've done tons of work by industry equivalent, and we always come back to the same factuals, which is, the digital entrant is not killing the incumbent. 
is the agent of change of the incumbent. And usually, when you have destruction at the economy level, it's because the second incumbent mispriced or scared or whatever else. So I like the way you say it, Michael. You are the agent of change. And to your questions about the politician, maybe the politician should basically start to build up these companies and just challenge, because at the end of the day, it's changing the orthodoxies. That's the point number one. And the point number two, and I totally agree with, with, with what has been said on the, on, on, on the, on the teachers and our jobs. You, you are challenged on things that you do possibly well, which is routine-based, and you need to be doing something which is mentorship and the like. And when you ask people, can you mentor? If you ask you, can you mentor? A lot of people say, no, I cannot do it. And actually, you have done it so many times that you don't remember. And the point is that you have to remember that you have to be self-confident that if you have kids, you have mentored them once in your life. So you can do it. And I think the problem as well is that these skills are not that they exist. They are really latent demand to explore. And we need these platforms because these platforms and that encouragement, the social environment of nurturing these things is what we need. We need more positive momentum of experiment than just simply saying, well, let's, let's be stuck. It's something that doesn't seem to work. And that's what I like really much about the online, uh, uh, the online attackers. It's not that they attack. It's because they actually push the, the, uh, the agency well, of change that we don't see enough in education these days. That's, that's, I think, very true, that technological development is an agent of change. But as far as reforms in education go, then I always remember the, an anecdote that was, I was told by my predecessor at Tartu University. He said that reforming a university is like relocating a graveyard. There's absolutely no cooperation from inside and absolutely no understanding from outside. <laughs> um, I think there is some pieces of truth in that observation. Um, but we do have uh, innovators, both among politicians as well as, as university presidents. But I think one thing is really true. There will be more private, non-public providers of educational services of different kinds. This is a growing, clearly a growing segment. This puts a very strong pressure on the institutionalized educational institutions and clearly pushes the, 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 the institutions away from their traditional hierarchical attitudes. We all have agreed that teachers must move towards coaching, mentoring, uh, facilitating, but the same is true about governments. Governments shall move away from education providers to education facilitators. Organizing, running the system, looking where, the, where, where you can get it, what it was, faster, cheaper, deeper, and better, something of that kind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I have another one other question. Mm. What do we see? In educational spending, also public attention. So it usually starts at the age of five or seven when we start in the basic schools. Then we spend something like, let's say, uh, 10,000 10, per student per year. Then we enter the gymnasium, high schools. We spend 15,000. Uh, 15, then we go to universities. We spend 20, 30, 40,000 a year. And then we stop public spending, almost stop it. And we spend very little in preschool years. But the basic problem, as we've discussed it so far, is not that much even about skills, forget about knowledge, but about attitudes. Attitudes towards what we do, how we behave. The, there is one skill that you mentioned, is that universities and traditional institutions, they teach complaining skills <laughs> instead of problem-solving skills. What do you think, should we move to even earlier years where the basic attitudes are formed? More attention to really early preschool, kindergarten years, where the communication skills, very basic social skills are developed and where the families not always can provide all what's needed. Moving away the attention from, you know, prestigious university institutions to the three-year, four-year, 
five-year-olds so that they develop very basic personal, interpersonal skills that help them in lifelong learning. Well, Is that it? In our case, we have a free universal childcare. Uh, we pay for, we pay parents for those who are working or those who are in social need. Uh, it's free from zero to three and then kinder as well. Uh, because we know that the first 1,000 days since the conception of children is, is very important. Um, my, personal, my personal experience is that if we do not also but work on the primary and secondary schooling, because it's the formal schooling that kills a lot of creativity. I enjoy visiting kindergarten uh, because the children tell you what they believe and what they feel. They don't care whether you're a minister or a bishop or a pope or whatever. But the older they get, the more they conform. So I really believe that that is the way to go. But apart from that, and something that w was mentioned in these two days, we must find a budget to help lifelong education in a real way throughout your, throughout your years. Uh, getting banks, getting employers, getting unions, getting governments, getting the European Union to put a fund together, to give it to the persons, not to the institutions, to accompany them throughout their life. I like what you say, but two, two small comments as well. My dad used to say to me, there is not such a thing as being lazy, that people who lack objectives. And if you lack objectives, it's because you're not curious, but you are born curious. So what prevents you to continue? And so I think it's a mindset as well that uh, my dad coached me at that time, didn't know what it means, but that's true. I don't need to be financed to be curious and to continue. I just read tons of books, and any time I go to somewhere online, I need to read something because I'm going to find something that makes my pleasure. I'm very basic in that sense. <laughs> I, I just want, so we need to restore this element. The second element is that even myself, where I try to convey the message, it's very good to do the, 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 the observation type. My kids are in a kind of Montessori uh, school. And boy, that's tough because uh, you say, I, you know, I got a very traditional career, you know, the PhD and everything else, and you know, the big schools. And these go, they go to a certain school, totally random, and obviously they learn everything from social observation. They go to the wood, they don't try to count. They just look at nuts, they take the nuts, and they finally derive the fact that that's four, okay? Now, that's the way we should learn. The problem is that when they happen to be nine, both of them, I, I give them something to read, and I could see, wow, the boy next door can read, they cannot read, <laughs> okay? So I was scared. And so the point is that you don't have confidence yourself, and you are the incumbent. You don't want this system to happen. Now, one year after, they read all the books you can imagine because it's exponential. And so the exponentiality of this thing is quite fundamental because it's social. But so, again, the point is that I also believe that going not at the system level is difficult because the social pressure is still, well, are your kids reading? Yeah, no, I can say it, but two years ago I would say, look, don't, 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 don't try to read in front of my neighbor, please. Huh? Because, you know, you didn't know what happens. So I think it's important that, again, we, we come back to this foundation of social science, because that's what we are, of the observation the like, and create the curriculum at that level. I also believe that daring, trying, being curious about things, it's actually the premise of an easy education going on, because people will know how to do it. This being said, that's for the generation, if we start doing it, that's going to start now. We still have, you know, 20 years where all of us are going to be in trouble, or my kids will be in trouble. So yes, we have to find something in between. Alison, how young are your youngest, uh, youngest students in, in Alison? Oh, so our focus is on the workplace. So, you know, studying maths at 11, 12, that type of thing. I guess the, quest, the general question of where to put money you know, um, as much as I would be very pro-technology um, as the father of four children, uh, that the last place I would want to put technology is to force it into kids at a young age. Uh, if there's any investment that we have, is children need people around them uh, to develop empathy and all of those lifelong things that we need. So that's where the major investment needs to go. If there was 
money, scarce money. But that's not to, to obscure from us the fact that when we send children to second, primary and secondary school, that there is part of where that is factual learning, and there's part that's social development. And sometimes people just say school is about learning, but of course it's just not. It's not. But, uh, and the social development to society is probably the most valuable thing that's done there. So we can't scrimp on that. But where we can, where we can uh, perhaps provide more efficient tools, certainly uh, technologies can be introduced into older children's lives uh, quite successfully. So, um, but we do have to be aware of the social and learning divide. I guess where I would be more skeptical of where government would be putting scarce resources is into the lifelong learning. Uh, in my talk earlier, I was saying to, you know, the world is now becoming awash with high quality, free resources. Um, government policy alone, without necessarily signing a check, can do an awful lot. As I was saying, giving recognition to people who have studied. You know, you can have people who study online and study entirely about network engineering, but they've never actually done a Cisco qualification or they've never done a degree. You need to be able to recognize that because they can probably f fix problems at your workplace that others can't. You know, so when, when you, you, you need to be asking about informal learning and, uh, and giving it value. Now, that doesn't cost any government any money. It's just recognizing, it's asking smart questions. That's the value of intelligence, of, uh, in the value of understanding what really needs to get learned. So uh, I see, like, we talked about inequality, or we talk about how, how do we open up uh, education to every level of society? Well, there are people in society who don't know what's best for them. I mean, we have to say that. We're not saying we're any better or worse than them, but that's the fact. And a lot of these people are lowest skilled, as was said in some of the OECD reports there earlier on. We need to mandate learning for these people. And if it's free, then they, haven't, they, they shouldn't have any issue with it. And their employers shouldn't have any issue with imposing it. And I think uh, I gave the extraordinary example of people in prison there earlier on today. And, I, and it, you just sh see how in amazing uh, free learning can be. And, and I say so, I'm not saying that I, I, Alison wants to own free learning, I'm just saying, I, I'm speaking as an advocate of free learning generally. Of course, with the provision that the, that the free learning is quality learning. You know. So I, I, to, to summarize there, I, I, I think that if, if you're spending money, definitely the focus has to be on early childhood, and the more and more you get into lifelong learning, I think you can be smart about it and not necessarily yes. be spending an awful lot of money. Well, I'm sorry, sorry for, for David. I, I think we may pick some questions from the audience. If, if there are some, and then we'll continue with you. Just Some investment in my own country is, is happening at the kindergarten to high school level with the theory that what has gone on in the past has produced um, good students, but not well-rounded students. And so the new philosophy is that what guides curriculum development are three principles, passion, purpose, and personalization. And that high school and the early years of high school should be used for students to explore more about things that activate passion within them. And that more and more our curriculum needs to make a direct link between purpose and, and learning, uh, particularly in subject areas like mathematics, uh, where often it's taught in a very abstract way. So I think those are the kinds of strategies that are being used to put pressure uh, in the system to think differently about how we educate young people without stifling their creativity and indirectly putting pressure on our post-secondary and college system to accept a new generation of students coming in their direction who will be guided by a whole new set of principles and passion being one of them. So, there are other questions. So-called Z generation is often referred as free spirits who do not care much about financial and employment stability. How do you motivate them to think about their skills in the scope of employability? How do you? <laughs> Stick or carry? <laughs> or both? Well, it's too small comment, obviously. It's usually a fallacy. Every X, Y, Z generation, we all were there, and then one day we age, and then we, <laughs> we, we fall into the <laughs> trap of the system. So uh, it's good that at least there is a Z, a Z generation. I would be scared if there's none in the first place. And two, it's a good thing. Uh, uh, and again, I don't think that employ, employment stability uh, is a good thing for, for many people. Actually, 
uh, employability, that means the capacity to choose and pick and choose, is actually a, gr a great bargaining tool. And I, I, I really like the fact that I've actually on the, on the supply side of the, demand, uh, of the labor market, people are taking at least their bargaining chip in, in the right way. And again, the whole point in the experience of McKinsey, we work, you know, I work a lot with 25 years old kids. That's possibly the X generation. I don't know what, they, what it is. So these guys are basically, I'm twice their age, and I look at them like the, the first day I joined. And again, they are not the same as I, as I am, or I used to be when I was 25. But, 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 but the interesting thing is that they have the, 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 the good questions most of the time. Why should I do that until the extra mile? Why do you think this is worthwhile as an activity? And, the like. and I think it's very, it's very important. So they get from the motivation side. But I always come back to say, as far as they, this is what motivates them, and they do the extra mile for what matters, it's still okay. And again, I, I believe it's not a question of generation. It's a question that uh, 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 they start to realize that uh, employability is important, but it's not the only thing that they can have in life. Uh, and two, they start to challenge the orthodoxies of employability in firms. Again, this is the same thing as before. Remember, agriculture, 90% of us, we were self-employed. We got the manufacturing era, <laughs> we were all went to firms, and then we started to get away from that in services, and now people are starting to say, oh, being uh, uh, self-employed is actually difficult because I need the security of a firm. But before, they were saying the firm is bad because they obliged me to work. So there's no free lunch. And I think this is a bit of the pendulum as well that is happening. But I really like the fact that at least uh, I've got face of the, uh, uh, you know, when young people are actually saying, I want to change orthodoxy. It's good stuff. Thank you, Jacques. Maybe we take an, another question if there is. What should be the role of public policies in preventing and reducing the inequality in earnings and opportunities for people at the opposite ends of the skills spectrum? Who would be ready to comment on that? Would I think this is a case where it's more socioeconomic policies rather than education policies, and where policies need to be aligned throughout. A point I wanted to make was because this concern was shown throughout uh, this conference. It's as if there is a contradiction between educating for employability and educating for life. Uh, there is no contradiction. The skills that we need today for employability, not for job-specific training, but employability, problem-solving, working with others, you know, being creative, it's those kind of skills and values. We need them also for society. And where I think we need to get together is, is, is actually these skills and values which go beyond technical competence, but also ethical considerations and learning to live, to live with others uh, in, a, in a way where we don't have any comfort zones anymore. Well, I'd come up with a slight change of our topic. I very much agree with you, Mike, that we need to, to recognize the skills acquired through lifelong learning or work experience in different informal ways. But to do so, we need some formalism. We need some definitions of skills, some standard agreements of what is, you know, if we can, we can say he can, you know, uh, knows math on the level of a second year or third year student. But what about these hardly measurable uh, personal skills like, I don't know, communication skills? How, to, how is standardized? Do you see here a problem? Who should take that over? Shall that be a global exercise or a national government should address that? Or should we proceed? Should OECD do something about it? Or would Google or, I don't know, LinkedIn would take over? They promised a lot, I understand. <laughs> would you? Well, isn't that exactly the, the example where government should start getting out of uh, and start, you know, setting standards on stuff that it really doesn't know too much about? It, you know, the government should be the the, uh, the organizer of last resort, and uh, a, a lot of the, uh, you know, and, and it has played, of course, in, in various types of political structures that role in, in, in intense and less intense uh, situations in various different countries. But uh, the, uh, you know, for workplace learning, certainly. The arbiter of, of whether uh, learning is, is good or not is, is surely the employer, or surely the, the rates of self-employment, or the, surely the rates of success in entrepreneurship. 
So, uh, you know, in that sense, it's, it makes a lot of sense, I think, to, to let the market decide what's good or not. Um, there are standards, you know, so I, it needs to be understood that, you know, online learning is really at its infancy. So sometimes people see it as a threat. Well, the easiest time to deal with a threat is when it's young and it's, it's, it's only growing. But it is going to get stronger, and standards will be more recognizable. Um, and, and look at that example that I was giving earlier, say, say with, with hotels and going in. Do, you, do we really need another solution to tell us whether a hotel is good to be staying at or not, rather than TripAdvisor or its, its competitors? It does the job profoundly. It, it, you know, we don't need any other solution. I, I think the same is coming in education, but the industry isn't as organized as, say, the travel industry. The travel industry was, was innovating online maybe 10, 15 years ago. Education is really only taking speed since maybe 10 years ago uh, when uh, we came around and then Khan Academy and, and, and other long, uh, large platforms. So th there's, a, there's a lot of maturing to do. It's just be a bit more pa be, be patient with it. It's coming. But I think what we must not do is let academics define what is informal and non-formal <laughs> yes. learning. So that would kill it completely. They would be measuring a fish yeah. and accusing it of not being a bird. For speaking, as of <laughs> speaking as a minister of education, uh, that's an that's academic as yes. well. Okay. Exactly. S self confessed. Yes. And, and, and that's the fallacy of the question, I would say. If you ask my kid whether it's a measure, he said the number of likes I got on Facebook. Whether you like it or not, that's for them the, the metrics they, they, they are using as, as doing that. But again, I, I think I really like Mike's point, which is not necessarily we need more states or less states. Uh, my point is that. Uh, at the end of the day, we don't have a problem of supply. Abundance is starting to happen on the content side and the like, but we don't have the mechanism for people to actually absorb them. And that's what we have to work on. It. So what's the value of services for doing that? My kids today can experiment on, on, on YouTube and do their own presentation and basically send to their friend and see, and, and they can have communication capabilities that I will never have imagined to, be, to, you know, to, to teach them, let alone to be taught. And, and they do it. So they have a pragmatism aspect of it. And I think they're there. They do a lot of things. They're not judged. And so the danger is that we put the wrong matrix, and on top of that, we make it normative. And then people are just saying, well, I failed, so I don't do it. And the story of many lives is that when people have low jobs, low scalability, it's not that people are, 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 don't have any skills. Simply some, sometimes people have told them, you don't. But they have. I think we need to enrich that. And I really like the idea of saying we should really motivate more of that aspect of experimentation for kids and for all of us. Really. Who wants to come on the panel and talk? <laughs> That's that, the same. That basically means that I mean, a classical understanding of, of national education systems is very much based on standards. So it was born, national education system, 19th century. It's, it was all about national curricula, unifying, setting standards. So it seems that we are now moving away from that, leaving this to a really basic minimum. And as far as definition of skills, mapping of skills, mapping the needs, mapping the trends, this will gradually be given over to different then uh, platforms like LinkedIn, which I think has a database that's much bigger than any national database ever can be. Is, is that the trend you see? And, and this is, by this means, also becomes much more global and international rather than nationally limited within not the small borders of Estonia, but even in the small borders of US or China. Well, maybe in the future, but right now, everything that appears on your LinkedIn profile is unauthenticated. I mean, you can yeah. say you're an astrophysicist, and uh, 50 people can endorse you, and somehow you are. <laughs> and so I think that that's the big problem, is how do we actually authenticate against what it is you believe you can do? And so I think that's the big issue for industry in Canada. That's why they wrote the paper on matching up of skills and calling for a pan-Canadian competency framework that at least at some level details the things you can do that you can attribute in some way and demonstrate that competence, maybe attribute it and authenticate it with a badge that you push to your LinkedIn profile. Certainly that's where we would like to go. But I think you have to have some way of measuring or authenticating that you actually can demonstrate a competence. 
especially when it's skill-based. It's not enough to say, I took a course in swimming. <laughs> Show me that you can swim. But, but it needs to have its own specific framework, it not does. be taken over by format. No, 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 no. But, but what it says that, to your question, it, we're not necessarily saying the metrics are changing. They are changing because they are actually failing. But the point is that the government has not to basically be the norm, but the governments could be actually the market maker yes. of those yep. things and animate exactly. the platform. Exactly. And at the end of the day, it's like eBay. You know, on eBay, I can have third-party sales. I don't trust, but some people have said, look, I really trust these people can deliver the goods. Uh, and, uh, you know, there is, a, th there is a market mechanism in the platform. But states today, in a world of con connectivity, you know, states possibly can play a much better role of matching and be part of these elements without having the norm. It's simply to say, look, I verify, does not seem too much. Now, it's up to you to at least go for the transaction cost of the information you want. But I also believe the states are, have a very good role of playing as the intermediary on those platforms. Our organization is a, a research and development organization, a change agent to push our universities and colleges forward. So we're running eight badging pilots right now foreign universities, foreign colleges. We didn't think the universities would put up their hand at all. They all put up their hand. They all want to try it out. And what we're interested in is not necessarily the result, but how they go about designing those competency frameworks. What do they believe is meaningful, and how does that become part of the milieu that we can all examine to help build something that's a common platform? Well, we have some time to take a few questions from the floor. How and to what extent would the EU serve as a coordinator in <laughs> modernizing of learning in order to address new skills requirements? Do we believe that the EU has a role? It has to push more. Even talks about the skills agenda. It has to be more coordinated and it has to have also then the resources uh, to, to, make it, to make it happen. That is where I was asking about alignment of policies. Um, because there is also a divide in the EU about uh, the difference between education and skills and the, um, the Commissioner for Education and the Commissioner for Employment are different. And we need to get these two worlds to work together. Um, you know, that, that is still a problem in a, in a lot of countries as well, that you have the Ministry of Education and you have the Ministry of Employment. Well, in my case, We've combined both, so I'm to blame for everything. If there is unemployment <laughs> or if there is educational failure. Uh, but it's true. I mean, we have to get the two worlds to work together as much Shall as possible. Shall you legislate into no. educational no. skills? No. No, I don't think it should Good. legislate top down. But talking no. and bringing people, people together, together, like yes. we've done that here in Tallinn, yes. is okay. Yes. yes. Also yes. good. Because it can't be a one size fits all either. Yeah, but, uh, and, and again, orthodoxies. We all know we're in the, in the game of platforms. Why should I be a coordinator? I, I, I put myself into the question of your model of education and saying, how do I create the positive externalities of social networks so that people start to share, you know, their video, they post their skills and the like. You know, YouTube has done it. Uh, you know, many platforms are working on the, on the two sides of the market by creating these externalities. Why will the state not be the catalyzer, not the coordinator of that? So what would prevent you, me, and all of us to post things about the how-to and the like? Surprisingly, if you go to YouTube, there are two types of channels people watch. Number one is the MTV-like, uh, especially your kids. They don't watch the classical MTV. The second one is the how-to. It's the how-to, but it's still a how-to channel. How do you basically uh, uh, try to fix something instead of, hey, why not to share and brainstorm about this issue? How can the... the, the the, the, the EU, for instance, does not create a platform where all of us, we can be online, discuss, sharing experiments, share it, see what works, what does not work, and create that externalities. That's an example. Yeah. I'd be afraid just a little bit to let go the opportunity of using uh, law in terms of getting people learning on, on the ground. Uh, as I said, uh, that there is a portion of populations that, that really need to be helped. And uh, we, t we, we all talk about SMEs. Uh, yes. employing most of the 
people that are employed across Europe. And uh, these people generally don't take advantage of learning management systems or learning. And uh, you know, it, it, I think it's, it's obvious that uh, every employee should be doing some learning online. And how do, how do we get them to do that? And motivation only goes so far. And what we find just from, from now decades of, of doing this stuff, if you can get somebody to learn once, you'll get them to learn twice. So the, the, the challenge is to get them to do one course online. And maybe you, 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 you use the, the legal framework to get them on the, on, on the ladder, and then less pressure after that. Are there any more questions from the floor? <laughs> Decision making and students. Well, certainly, they, uh, students, uh, they, they vote by, their, by what they do. <laughs> and uh, watching analytics is, is very powerful. And uh, you know the, the analytics and, and being able to and looking at psychometrics. Uh, you know, there's a lot of analytical tools that we have at our disposal that we haven't been allowing the masses to access because we've been wanting to make money out of them. But actually, if we, re we get a little bit more releasing in our what we in the RIP, uh, such as even aptitude tests to to actually knowledge and skills, I, I think we're on the road to a better feedback, world. Feedback, feedback, mm -hmm. and feedback. Yeah, yeah it's let, let's not be defensive about IP. Okay. Spread it, because you, you, it's the, the valley of a thousand flowers type of thing. I think we should give more importance to students' voice, even in how we design our programs. It's in our interest to do that, because if they find it relevant, then they're going to follow it. This is, a, I think, a very, very specific and very, very interesting topic. There are different approaches, as you know. Very many European countries have adopted that they formally participate in decision making. We have students on our boards. We, they formally have a vote in what we do academically. And there's another more custom-oriented approach where the universities are the service providers. They take feedback. They take good advice. They do a number of good things. They, they take very, very seriously, but they leave the hard work of decision making and responsibility their job not the student's responsibility to decide on things. And I think this debate is a very, very serious one. Both are right in their own ways. Well, I, I think we... I may come up before summarizing with a, with a local problem, if I may say so. Estonia is not a small country. Estonia is a very small country. And we've heard, heard here big platforms, usually delivering courses in English, addressing millions and hundreds of millions of students, potentially at least. And then somewhere in the end of the world, there is a country like Estonia with one million Estonian speakers who want to have that in Estonian, or last but not least in Maltese, in your country. <laughs> How, how, how we should proceed with this challenge of uh, small cultures, educational spaces, limited language-wise, and the, the, the scaling, the big numbers that really make it efficient and fast and adaptive fail. Is there any solution you may provide to this? If you think Estonia is small, try Malta. <laughs> 400, 440,000. Or Iceland. The size of Tallinn. And <laughs> Well, I think we can turn the thing upside down, actually. In the 70s, there was the doctrine that if you're small, you're very vulnerable and you're very fragile. Thankfully, that changed into if you're small, you can be resilient and you can be agile. And I think we should use our, our size to be agile, to be resilient, and to... It has nothing to do with size. Knowledge has nothing to do with size. We can make things happen, and Estonia is definitely one of the... You've already examples. demonstrated, we saw yesterday, all of the citizen services that are available <laughs> electronically in Estonia. Education needs to be a part of that. You know, uh, as, as we, we have learners and graduates in, in every country, we often come across this uh, issue. The, the problem is technically uh, less difficult than people think. Um, the real issue is, you know, who's asking for this? And are they really interested? And what are they willing to pay for it? And for on the likes of the uh, analysis platform, so we have a thousand courses. If the Estonian state came to us tomorrow and said, 
create a structure whereby all of these courses, mostly in English and some in Arabic, uh, can be translated into, um, into the local language. That would be quite easy to facilitate. And Google thing, will do that for us. He'll do it in, in, some time. in, in an automatic way, yeah, but uh, whether you want <laughs> you to provide it to your children or not. No, it does. It, 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 it's getting better all the time. But uh, the one th uh, I'll just add one final comment on that. I, I haven't had experience with Estonia. We've about 25,000 learners in Estonia, I think, uh, which is not a very big number in comparison to other countries. But uh, I noticed that uh, in places like Croatia, Serbia, Albania, where we have lots of learners, it is inundated with the number of people that write to us to say, can I change this course into Albanian and Croatian? Yeah. So there's no shortage, probably, of people in Estonia that would be willing to take an English written course, say maybe somebody with, with subject matter expertise in engineering or whatever, and to change it into the local. That could be done very easily. People always think that's a big problem. The, the challenge is no one's been asking for that to be done. Yeah. Well, we're running, we've got 50 seconds left before <laughs> we have to hand over to Minister Osinovsky, who's in the front row listening to us. We have the opportunity to give him good advice for policies on the European as well as on Estonian level. It is not easy to summarize, <laughs> gentlemen. We've had so many great ideas that to put them into 50 seconds is almost impossible. But what I think, a few, few key words. Access to education and skill is a, is a public responsibility. Access to different groups, different people, and do that using the modern technologies. This is a solution. We can't reach them otherwise than making use of the technologies. Recognize skills and learning, informal, formal, practice-based, work-based, university courses, all kinds of different experiences that make sense on the labor market. Skills. Increasingly trust employers in standards, what they need. And last but not least, employability. I think very many people are afraid when they hear that education is about employability. And we've had a question here that is education about employability? No, it's not, I think, but employability must be thought in a broad sense. Everything that you do, using your skills or education, is in one way or the other not only serving yourself, but other people. And if what you do serves other people, they will give you some money <laughs> to develop your skills further and do even more good things for other people. So I think employability is not that much in technical capitalist term, but rather in a, in, a, in a community service terms, and that, I think, is a fair goal enough. So, dear audience, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, the audience, I mean, for your questions and patience. I'd like to thank my colleagues on the panel for their contribution to this meeting, and I think our panels convene on that. Thank you. Thank you.